today's voicemail is as follows, quote, At the heart of Burma's problems was a state that did not control its territory and a society divided on who belonged and who did not. Both were colonial legacies. In 1948, the British had left behind a weak state that collapsed within months into civil war. There was no real strategy for how a state could be knitted together. The old-fashioned way was for the central power to defeat its enemies on the battlefield, but the road to state building, a military approach, was not desired. Any questions around belonging were raising their heads at the same time as democracy was trying to take root. Identity-based mobilisation was the most obvious way to gain political advantage. Troublemakers saw the value in setting communities against one another. There was no vision of Burma as a multiracial and multicultural place. Welcome to part two of Burma, a crisis of history. I'm your host, Nishta Amin, bringing you the ending episode to this topic. In part one, we started in the medieval period, tracking a few of the early kingdoms which sprung up in the region of present-day Burma, their links to each other and to the wider region. For example, we looked at the heavy influence of classical Indian culture, of trade with China, India, and later with Europe as well. One of the main threads we talked about was the mix of languages and ancestry born from the range of ethnicities. So Burma or Burman refers to the one majority group alongside the Shans, the Mons, Karens, Kachins, and later the Arakanese. And tracing their genealogy is tentative. In total, these groups are categorised in a broad term like being part of the Sino-Tibetan language group, with any number over 560 worth of languages. Such complexity was dealt with differently across periods of time, so we mentioned how for Burmese emperors or for the Arakanese kings, ethnicity or language was recognised, obviously, and whilst these kingdoms were warriors and they were conquerors who, like most of humanity, competed for power and money and land, their ideas on, quote, race um, were more flexible, fluid perhaps, and most important, it was accepted. It wasn't, you know, a sort of existential issue that there were different linguistics, dialects, and skin colours. Um, so, for example, the Kombang dynasty viewed themselves as being a warrior people who thought themselves supreme to the peoples in Thailand, Assam and Manipur in India, but once brought under their control, there wasn't this centralised or stringent ideology-based system of classifications based on race or skin colour. And even if you haven't listened to part one yet, you can maybe hazard a guess as to where I'm going with this um, recap. So when the British arrived, they brought their own beliefs of racial hierarchy and with them, beset with skin colour spectrums to skull and nasal indexes into their colonies, giving us all a world-class performance of divide-and-conquer policy. British colonialism fixed lines and borders to suit the economic exploitation of the British, but simultaneously it also solidified racial or ethnic identity into these ladders of hierarchy that were also linked intricately or subtly to economic opportunities. So the natives, uh, the Indian migrant labourers, Chinese and the Europeans, they all had different functions within the, uh, within the economy. Um, so for example, Europeans monopolised top layers in the government and in companies. A bit lower down were Indian, Chinese um, and some Burmese landowners or businessmen. And then further down were all the non-Europeans, so the working class, the farmers, or the poor Burma, the various tribes indigenous to Burma, and then the poorest of the Indian migrants. We also mentioned how the converts to Christianity, for example the Karens, were given priority in the colonial army. They, ma they made up nearly half of the colonial Burmese army and were given superior positions over the Burma, which would later contribute to animosity between these groups once the British left. To the plural nature of Burma's people, um, it all served Britain's unfettered colonial capitalism. And as George Orwell wrote in the 1920s, quote, the British are robbing and pilfering Burma quite shamelessly. So as we move forward into the 20th century, the British legacy of divide and conquer solidified a link between race and economics. And often in historical narratives, the economic uh, side is left quiet or misunderstood, which uh, Tant Min U in this book is seeking to reverse in the narrative of Burma. So this episode will be broken up into three main sections. Firstly, we'll discuss the main political developments of the military dictatorship from the 60s to the 90s alongside Burma's economy. Second section, we're going to talk about the present figure of Aung San Suu Kyi, 
the current de facto leader of Wagner. And then in the third and final section, I'm going to focus on Arakan and the Rohingya crisis. Let's begin. So, as hinted in the ending of part one, World War II lasted for a short time in Burma's history, but the depth of its impact was long lasting. In the three years of war, nearly every town was flattened by Allied or Imperial Japanese bombing. The economy was ruined and hundreds of thousands lost their lives. The Allied victory in 1945 saw the British take control of Burma once more, but only for a short while to hand over the reins to a new and independent political system, a sort of fetus democracy with a socialist agenda. On January the 4th, 1948, Burma officially became a new nation state, independent of its former British master. Unfortunately, the peace, which was sought after World War II, did not fully materialise. The new government was led by a group or a party called the Union Party, which had been a faction that splintered away from the anti-fascist uh, People's Liberation League, led by Burma's first Prime Minister, U Nu. Now, the root issue with this new government was legitimacy. Free governments don't work unless they're legitimate in the eyes of their citizens. Now, colonial Burma had not benefited the Burmese politically or economically, and the idea that this region, um, whose history or prior history had been based on competing and hereditary kings or emperors, whose divisions had then been crystallised under British rule, were now going to accept this new, mostly ethnic Burmese-led government, was quite short-sighted. Months later, the country descended into civil war, alongside a decimated economy, a war-ravaged topography, poverty, demobilised soldiers, and contested legitimacy and rule. So beyond Rangoon, many rural areas were still controlled by various insurgent groups, and at the heart of these rebellions against the new government was the fundamental difference of opinion about the shape and ideology of this new Burma. So remaining members of the Anti-Fascist People's League were dissatisfied and they led rebellions, holding onto roads and bridges, taking over networks of transport. The Karen group, they didn't trust the Burmese because remember under British rule, the Karens were at the top of the military ladder. Now with their British patrons gone, the roles were reversed and they feared retribution. On top of this, the new Prime Minister, Unu, was making strides towards traditional ideas of Burmese authority rooted in Buddhism. He introduced a series of measures which essentially wanted to make Buddhism the state religion. Such moves worried the Christians, the Muslims and the communist groups who were already unwilling to declare allegiance to this new government. Later on in the 50s, Chinese soldiers who were loyal to Kai Shek, um, he was the guy who had tried to unify China under a nationalist government in the late 1920s before being ousted by the communist revolution, they were supplied with backing by the CIA and launched attacks on Burma's border. The Burmese army fought back fiercely, ultimately winning the conflict, but the nature of the early Cold War and the harsh legacy of British colonialism combined to make the new military regime extremely fearful and suspicious of the outside world, and this feeling of paranoia would simply grow as the decades went on, preventing Burma from connecting to other countries openly, but also more importantly, this paranoia would become a driving force and dictate how the regime behaved in the future. So by the 60s, political factionalism and insurgency had been poorly dealt with. The British ideal of parliamentary democracy had been a failed experiment in the early years, because instilling such ideas requires a specific history of basic principles, like sovereignty in the people or equality in a legal sense, and the Burmese, especially outside the main cities, had received little to no education of any sort under British rule, and you can't install a democracy in a place with minimal exposure to democracy itself. On the 2nd of March 1962, General Nguyen led a coup, arresting the Prime Minister and 50 leading ministers, ushering in a military dictatorship for the next decades. In many ways, the army did restore a sense of order and prevented a full breakdown of the Union. Um, Burma's borders held together despite flare-ups here and there. And scared of the precedent set by the Korean War, which had been the Cold War's first hotspot, and the increasingly aggressive European and American overtures in Vietnam, Burma panicked. The military sealed itself off from the world, 
they set up a council and declared a programme called the Burmese Way to Socialism. Foreign trade was stopped, approximately 400,000 Indians were expelled and all businesses were nationalised. This was done to pacify the lefties and the communists internally, but to also remove Burma from being a Cold War target. This new programme, the Burmese Way to Socialism, was an off-key medley of socialist, nationalist and Buddhist elements leading the military dictatorship um, in Burma. Now for the minorities, this prevailing ideology was viewed with suspicion, seen as a Burmanization process. Ultimately, with no clear guiding policy, little interaction between government and people, and minimal, if not just zero, foreign investment, by the 1970s Burma had in many ways become a simpler place than its colonial peak. It was stripped of its cosmopolitan crowds, no more European landlords or bustling ports. It became a country of farmers and soldiers. In other ways, though, the crippling issue of poverty and racialized thinking merged with nationalism was rising beneath the surface. Now, instead of creating a socialist economy or even an economy with a tinge of social responsibility, what was emerging uh, in Burma was a strain of crony or army capitalism, one which Tan Min U argues isn't all that different from colonial capitalism. There was no concept of a welfare state, money was extracted from natural resources with no sustainable vision, um, private and black market businesses flourished, and any semblance of infrastructure built was made to cater to exports rather than imports. There was also definitely a system of patronage, um, so military rulers would be able to hand out land or contracts in the government to let businesses do things. So for example, um, to build a road or to build a bridge, they could charge any amount that they wanted to, to get that thing done. Um, so he talks about how an import license for just one car could be charged at around $100,000 and that would go back into the government's coffers. Now Minu argues that it wasn't just about profiting shamelessly, but it was actually inspired by how weak the state was. Um, you know, they couldn't roll out big plans on education or courts or markets. So what they would do is they would give a wealthy businessman so many acres of land who in turn would provide jobs for the local area and if feeling charitable, the odd school here and there. And here is Burma's core issue. It's an army or military cannot run a country properly and with success. The really obvious issue with having a military force guiding you is that they're left scratching their heads when it comes to peace. Historically and in the present, governments are always either doing two things with the army. They're either downsizing, which would mean they would then have to find uh, an employment alternative solution, uh, otherwise it would turn into Germany in the interwar period, or they have to keep their army busy, go off and fight this war here, go and fight this place over there, keep them busy or they'll turn on you. So when it comes to peace building, literally, how is how would a bunch of military leaders know what it would be like to run a country, to build bridges or administer schools or fund hospitals, or even just like keep spreadsheets on tax rates? You can't expect them to do that. The army is just one organ in the larger system of government, whatever the type of government that is. The most humbling um, thing that I found was the historian Min U. He really has seen it all, so he's had plenty of conversations um, as a counsellor and advisor to these generals and army ministers, and they reveal to him, and most are quite contrite, that they don't know what they're doing, they don't know about economic investments. So there was one conversation where um, he was recounting how they were planning to tear down um, a lot of the historical buildings in Rangoon, and Min U was like, hey, why don't you keep them as heritage sites and then tourists can come and that tourism will put money into the economy. And the general's response was, oh, we've never actually considered that. And that's just one minor example. So when Cyclone Nargis devastated Burma in 2008, which remains Burma's uh, worst natural disaster, the relief or the evacuation effort was shocking. It took months for the military to a swing into action, but B to allow certain groups like humanitarian or aid groups to enter. At one point they actually kicked out Doctors Without Borders because the um, head of the group had criticised the military's response to the disaster. But really, with no infrastructure, 
money and outside connections, the Burmese army failed to protect their people. And really, dictatorships aren't that great either. So General Nguyen, Win, who was the dictator at this time, was quite the nutter. He was reportedly quite superstitious and he hired and kept um, soothsayers as his, as his advisors. And in some of his most bizarre moves, based on astrological predictions that the number 90 was really special for him, in 1987, he ordered the Burmese banknote, uh, 100 kiat, to be wiped from circulation and then to be replaced with either 45 or 90 kiat notes. And all those with savings lost out terribly because the 100 kiat became worthless, essentially crippling a barely surviving economy. So coupled alongside all of this as well were Western sanctions on Burma as well, amped up under George Bush following the Iraq war and then continued under Obama as well um, because they viewed the, the dictatorship with extreme distaste. Um, and the sanctions imposed by the West were heightened in particular following the all-important year of 1988. So by the 80s, Burma was in the bottom of uh, 10 impoverished countries. The average Burmese household was spending 73% of its income on just food alone, which is a shockingly high uh, rate there. And by 2003, sanctions imposed on Burma were extremely tough so it was no investment, no development aid or assistance, no trade and as usual these sanctions they tend to only harm the ordinary people not the military or the you know political figures they they are saying that they're targeting. So before we turn to the black market economy that develops and the insurgent groups as well we have to quickly talk about 1988 um, that all-important year because it informs how the military behaves in the 90s. So up to this point, Nguyen, Win, the dictator, since 1962, under his rule there had been two uh, major developments. The army became a battle-hardened unit and second, the economy was bankrupt and dissatisfaction had grown amongst young adults, specifically university students from Rangoon. In August 1988, protests began and quickly spread to all parts of Burmese society and they called for a nationwide strike. So people took to the streets, um, local police units even joined, doctors, teachers, even sections of the state media joined in the strike. And following weeks of unrest and what seemed to be the brink of revolution, General Nguyen Win makes the stunning announcement that he's going to step down. And then there were suggestions swirling around that the army was considering um, a multi-party government. Then on the 18th of September, the military took back power formally and voted against any moves to a multi-party system. The protests turned into riots and the army began to shoot. The exact number of how many died or you know, were killed is unknown, but it's likely that it was in the thousands. Um, so 1988 is remembered as the year of uprising, this historic moment when Burma almost toppled the army. Instead, the army survived and a new dictatorship with a different head called General Fan Shui took over. Now, Fan Shui was more open to change, um, obviously though only on the army's terms, um, but they were tentative and cautious, especially after the uprising. So he promised to open up Burma a bit more, prioritising foreign investment. In many ways, he was sort of considering following the Asian pathway, which is export-based industrialization with no political, you know, liberalization or freedoms. Um, as a result of this, boycott Burma organizations sprung up across Europe and the USA with public pressure mounting again to punish the regime through even more sanctions. So let's talk about Burma's black market economy in the 90s. Now, back in 1948, when the Burmese Communist Party was still alive, they had attempted to seize power but failed, and they quickly became a guerrilla insurgency. So they retreated away from Rangoon and they spread out onto the hills of the northeast. Um, the Communist Republic of China sent thousands of so-called volunteers to help these guerrilla insurgents establish a liberated zone for the communists. 
So by the late 70s, the communists were holed up in these mountainous regions, and as a result, the highland people there, notably the Kachin and the WA, the W-A it's spelled, um, people, they became cannon fodder for the fighting between the communist guerrillas and the Burmese. However, um, by the early 80s, China was slowly becoming more reformist and it was decreasing its aid to these guerrilla forces before cutting it off altogether. So the commanders of these groups, now without their Chinese donor, they turned to the drug trade to continue making their profits. There was a system called the uh, Golden Triangle, an area which straddles Burma, Thailand and Laos. Um, a people from the Koh Kang region in Burma who claimed Chinese ancestry through the Ming Dynasty, they provided a stream of mule trains who carried opium to heroin refineries. The historian Ronald Findlay says that the seed capital of Burma is heroin. Now at first the Burmese government was fighting these groups but eventually tired and economically drained, they decided that it might be wiser to strike a deal with them, an illicit understanding. So in the late 90s there was essentially a series of ceasefires with the insurgent ethnic groups which brought the illegal narcotics trade into the official economy. So, that, so it was sort of an agreement of we'll let you unofficially will let you you know continue with your with your trading as long as you stop attacking us at the border so in 2019 Myanmar was dubbed the meth capital of the world or the meth menace in 2020 the Guardian reported that a raid just on one lab in the Shan state saw them uncover 200 million meth tablets 500 kilograms of crystal meth and 3,700 liters of methyl fentanyl so it's safe to say that illicit industries form a really important backbone of Burma's economy and it's a multi-billion industry which is government sanctioned or at least encouraged um, in, in different ways. Now another shady side of Burma's economy um, is also on the borders of China in the Kachin Hills um, and this area is home to the town of Bakant which is home to these really intense malaria jungles, but more importantly, the world's best quality imperial jade, more valuable than diamonds. Uh, Burmese jade exports by 2014, it was running up to about $30 billion a year, of which only a small amount of profit would make its way back to the Burmese government. Instead, this transnational mix of Singaporean, Chinese and Hong Kong firms who apparently their CEOs have these strong links with the WA insurgent group, that Chinese group we just talked about, um, who contract Burmese workers to mine, polish, and then transport the jade back to a growing and rich Chinese market. The workforce is described as being a mass of emaciated men who comb through muddy earth with their bare hands, hoping to find fragments of um, the precious stone of jade. To keep themselves from fainting, they shoot themselves with heroin, one needle worth one dollar. And these private companies um, pretty much have no accountability. Um, a landslide in 2015 killed more than 200 of their workers and no formal government was ever held to account. So there's a real crisis of um, protection of workers as well uh, in Burma's economy. Now Tant Min U, he ends this part by saying, that the evidence of why the regime ended up boosting drug lords or making deals with, with the Chinese government and insurgent groups, it didn't begin because they wanted profits or wanted to boost drugs in Burma, but rather it was a quite a rash and anxious reaction to what felt like regime decline, um, pressure from the Western sanctions, and also importantly, with 1988 fresh in their minds, it pushed them to make these covert and also ultimately deadly deals. Okay, so let's turn to section two of this episode, which is the um, focus on Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, she's the lady who you see in the news um, who's been put under house arrest quite a few times now by the military junta and in the West has been hailed as a beacon of democracy. Um, it's no exaggeration just how much the West, especially the US and Britain, has turned her into a symbol of freedom. Um, she rose to prominence in Burma during the 1988 uprising, making these um, really sort of provoking speeches um, which were televised widely. And she brought an air of youth and novelty to the movement, as up to that point the opposition was made up of mostly students and also elderly left-wingers. And her willingness to speak her mind 
and her method of calling for um, peaceful resolution and, and representation of the people attracted thousands to follow her. So there's two things we need to know about Aung San Suu Kyi. The first is her lineage and the second is her personal or political views. So her father um, was General Aung San, who had founded the militia of Burma's independence army, which then later became the national army. Um, he had in the 1940s risen up the ranks and um, become sort of famous as this straightforward, no-nonsense liberator who believed in the rights of Burma's indigenous people to govern themselves. And it was his militia that formed the nucleus of the future Burmese army. Um, when the British were going to leave, he was going to be next in charge, and at the age of 33, about to take power, he was assassinated by a jealous rival. So there is therefore this legend attached to Aung San Suu Kyi, that of her father, a man whose story was of devotion and sacrifice for his country, who fought against British colonialism and Japanese invasion. So when his daughter started to make speeches in 1988, um, during this time when there was a grassroots movement sweeping across the nation, people saw an almost natural um, opportunity for her to continue the legacy of her father, but do it properly this time. And just like her father is remembered as the um, nation's father, um, Aung San Suu Kyi became the chairperson and the figurehead of the NLD, the National League for Democracy, set up in 1988 as well. Now, before the uprising, she was actually living in, in Oxford, and she had written several articles outlining her thoughts about the nationalist movement in Burma. So she wrote about their progressive attempts to reassert their, quote, racial identity, and that the threat of Burmese survival came from the Indian and Chinese migrants, because, quote, not only they had a stronghold on the Burmese economy, they married and mixed with Burmese women, striking at the heart of racial purity, end quote. She's also a practicing Buddhist, a tenant of which is sacrifice. Um, so like monks, they leave their families and worldly service um, for their spiritual journeys. Similarly, in 1998, Aung San Suu Kyi's husband was dying from cancer. She was now under house arrest in Burma and she declined to visit him for fear that she would not be able to return. Now this sort of special sacrifice um, it made the Burmese people believe in her selflessness and that by doing, you know, by, by being ultimately selfless for the nation, it would succeed in bringing the military down. So in many ways, Aung San Suu Kyi and the army, they differ only in regards to the political structure of Burma because she wants a multi-party system, they want to keep their dictatorship. But when it comes to the ideological stance, they share those nativist feelings of Burmese racial purity, of nationalist leanings, and the centrality of Buddhism in politics. It's also really important to recognise that her link to her father, who was more than anything an army general, does guide her policy as well. So when she talks about the army, she's quite emphatic in stating that it's my father's army, not my enemy. And when she talks about democracy, it's more about having more power to the, quote, the people, and less about specific institutions or, you know, an economic road plan. So when she eventually becomes the de facto leader um, in 2015, following a series of moves which give her a bit more power, her policies are not clear-cut. The new and current constitution in Burma is a hybrid, so the army has 25% of seats, meaning it can veto reforms, but the NLD, which is her party, they still hold a 50% majority. So all non-military issues like the health budget, education and foreign policy, they're all in her hands. Now, Min U is quite sharp in his assessment of her leadership. He talks about how sparingly she uses her powers, that she spent a lecture at Rangoon University talking about literature and novels for two hours instead of talking about the economy or the peace process. And he also writes how ultimately her rule was never about solving people's problems in Burma, but to preside over the country with a personal story of nationalism, of you know, increased representation, whatever that means, and gritty determination in the face of opposition. So disregarding some of the nuances in her views and Burma's 
domestic tensions, the West embraced her in the early 2000s. She was hailed as this fearless Oxford-educated superwoman, standing peacefully against brutish military men, um, and the West really welcomed her as part of this larger cavalier campaign they had going on, which would be that democracy would solve all the issues of non-Western countries. And there was no attempt, more importantly, on the British or the American side to analyse the roots of Burma's military structure or its ethnic composition. There was no effort to analyse the country's recent and traumatic past of World War II and also colonialism. Condoleezza Rice, she listed Burma as an outpost of tyranny, activist in London and in the US, launched the I'm Not Going campaign to stifle any tourism, and even celebrities got involved, so Tony Blair, Ian McKellen, Jennifer Aniston, George Clooney, they all sort of threw in their hats and pledged to boycott holidays to Burma. So Aung San Suu Kyi became the figurehead the West needed to justify their pro-democracy or, you know, pro-imperialism politics in the East and Middle East as well. Now, I'm not trying to diminish her standing with the Burmese in any way, um, in her own right, irrespective of Western perceptions, she really is a respected and revered figure for the Burmese. But when it comes to the Western reactions, we only really see an airbrush perspective of Burma's issues and not the deep-rooted, depressing facts of the case. Okay, so on to the third and final section. The rose-tinted image of Aung San Suu Kyi slowly faded away in 2012, then 2016, and then was completely shot to pieces in 2019 when she travelled to the International Court of Justice in The Hague to defend Burma against the 46-page accusation of genocide against the Rohingya Muslims filed by Gambia on behalf of the Organisation of Islamic Cooperation. Her supporters in the West were now fully flabbergasted that despite mounting evidence, authentic evidence, of crimes against humanity, perpetrated by the Burmese military and supported by the civilians, that the former symbol of democracy and liberalism was personally going to defend such charges herself. The Rohingya crisis has loomed large on Aung San Suu Kyi's figure, with the focus being on her attacking or criticising her lack of action or refusal to condemn what's going on under her rule. Now, having finished the book um, by Min U, I think the uh, focus on Aung San Suu Kyi by media coverage is quite lacking in parts, um, because arguably the crisis started long before her rule, and its development into ethnic cleansing or genocide has been a process of larger forces at hand. So Min U writes how in the mid-90s to the 2000s, a quote, racial hue, um, was colourising talk amongst the Burmese, especially as the country was opening up its borders, for example, as we've seen with China. Now, Arakan, which is the state where the Rohingya crisis stems from, um, isn't monolith, of course, but internally there's a perception of a north and south divide, which we need to know about. So, in the north, um, where the Muslims call themselves the Rohingya, the Arakanese nationalists, they call them Bengalis, or they call them Kalas, so Kala means foreigner. Now, in the southern parts of Arakan, the Muslims there are deemed to be different from the Rohingya. They're known as Kamans, who Min U describes as being a separate Muslim group. So the Kaman are classed as indigenous folk with centuries-old claims to Burma. So in 1660, um, a Mughal prince called Shah Shuja, who had contested the Mughal throne, he lost, um, and he fled to Arakan and sought asylum in the kingdom of Muraku. So the story goes that he tried to overthrow the Arakanese king, Sangathod Hammer, um, but lost. He was killed, as were his men, but hundreds of his soldiers, who were mostly Afghan in origin actually, and specifically trained in archery, uh, they were merged into Arakan's forces, and then later referred to as the Kaman, which is the Persian word for um, an archer's bow. So they stayed and lived, they married, and became a part of Burma's pre-colonial history. So if you remember from episode one, we talked about how the European rupture created this divide in Burmese thinking that anyone before that 
was considered indigenous, but people who came after or during colonial times were invaders or profiteers. Now, skipping forward to the 1990s, the military junta started speaking um, about this 135 national races, capital N, capital R. Um, note the conflation there between race and nationalism. Anyway, the idea was that Burma is a nation of different people and therefore we need to recognise that. Um, and there was also, alongside this, um, the promise of a new constitution, which would say that any group of people or any race of people who constitute at least 0.1% of the populace are entitled to representation at the local level and more than half of two contiguous towns could give them the right to an autonomous zone. So Min U writes that after this announcement, um, there was one uni lecturer who whispered that giving the Rohingya a national race status would mean a part of Burma would fall under Sharia or Bengali law. So this perceived threat of um, what's called Islamization, that Muslims in Bangladesh were going to join forces with the Muslims in Arakan, in northern Arakan, amped up. Um, now this was heightened later on by the formation of the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, called the ARSA, which was in part, or was reportedly, um, set up by a man called Atatullah Junini. Um, now he was born in the 60s in Karachi, Pakistan, to Pakistani and Rohingya parents. He was fluent in both dialects, um, reportedly he went to school in Saudi, then trained in the military in either Pakistan or Afghanistan. And then following the 2012 riots, which we'll talk about in a bit, he set up this um, sort of soldier force, if you like. Um, now they're soldiers, so they attack government or army bases or police units. Now regardless of their intentions and which perspective you take on them, their violence is utilised by the Burmese to showcase that there is this external Islamic encroachment on Burma. ARSA, they claim they have no affiliation with external militant groups, however this hasn't stopped um, such accusations from you know, being uh, being held. So the Indian government um, apparently passed on intelligence to Burma, alleging links between the Rohingya militants and the Pakistani terrorist group who called themselves Lashkari e Taiba. Again, this is disputed information, but regardless of the ins and outs, the insurgent group's offensives started in 2013 that have led to counter-offensives um, by the Burmese army suspected militants and civilians alike perpetuating a cycle of violence and radicalization. I sort of digress there but we'll come back to the ARSA um, in a bit as well. Now Min U he interviews a guy called Tin Hlaing, um, a Muslim businessman who describes himself as being part Khmer and part Rohingya. He talks about how growing up there was no discrimination that he faced in the city of Sitwe um, and that he grew up quite happy. He went to study mathematics at university himself Hindi and English on the side and he now works for an Indian firm which hires um, Muslim workers. Now he recounts how this all changed by 2010 um, when he was sitting in a restaurant during the upcoming elections um, and he overhears a discussion in the room next door organised by the Rakhine Nationalities Development Party led by Arakanese Buddhists. Um, so he said that they talked about a spirit which when you translate it into English, means both racial and national. And that's because in Burmese, the word national comes from the word neo, which means seed, i.e. like the beginning point of reproduction. Um, and so again, it's that conflation of the word that, you know, your, your nationalism is tied to your ancestry or, or, or to your race from this biological sense. They went on to say, quote, this is our land, it's a Buddhist um, land, we need to be careful about the Kara, end quote. A few months earlier, the Burmese Consul General, accused of discrimination, said that the Rohingya were not part of Myanmar's ethnic groups, and he compared their, quote, dark skin um, to the Burmese's fairness, and that the Rohingya were, quote, again, as ugly as ogres. Um, instead of being reprimanded or punished, he was promptly promoted. In episode one, um, I talked about how Arakan has this really proud history of being independent um, from ethnic Burmese rule, that they are a separate and unique people. 
Um, the Arakanese, who are majority Buddhist, currently have a very specific type of nationalism which stems from this history and it causes tension on both sides. Now, Burmese nationalism is quite similar to Arakanese nationalism, but there's one major difference. So they both stress ethnic components, um, like the Burma or Arakanese, and that it's really linked to conservative Buddhism, characterised by a fear of foreigners and of modernity as well. So the border with China opening up, more Western companies being allowed, um, the use of internet by the late 2000s, etc. Now the difference between them is that the Arakanese nationalism, nationalism is also opposed to not just the Bengalis, but the Burmese as well. Arakanese nationalists fear they have this sense of being squashed from both sides, and it's tied to memories of Morocco being invaded by the Burmese, and also the influx of Muslims from British Bengal in the colonial period, nowadays Bangladesh. So the way that Arakanese nationalists frame their thinking is that, yes, there were Muslims who can claim indigenous status to Arakan because they have ancestors um, from Morocco, but you know that all got confused or, or muddied during the colonial period where we had um, migrants from India, from Bengal coming in and then mixing with these um, with these people and that's where the confusion or, or, or where the tension lies. Now a forgotten factor is that during World War II the British armed the Muslims and they called them Chittagonians named after a province in Bengal and the Japanese armed the Buddhist Arakanese so they essentially divided them. Um, so during the war Muslims and Buddhists slaughtered each other where they had once lived side by side. After the war ended um, some local Muslim leaders in the north reportedly toyed with the idea of joining forces with East Pakistan. Um, this was rejected by Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan. So faced with this rejection, they shifted their ideas towards creating a Burmese Muslim homeland within Burma itself. Um, now this was rooted out in 1954 following the Burmese army's operation on Soon, which saw Rangoon take control of Arakan once more. Um, nevertheless, Arakanese Muslims continued to have a history of insurgency throughout the 60s, and then the next big event was in 1971, uh, the Bangladesh Liberation War. During the violence and bloodshed, um, thousands of people from East Pakistan fled to Burma, um, and then again with heightened anxieties about these so-called illegal immigrants when they really were refugees or asylum seekers. Um, in 1978, um, the army operation called Dragon King um, rooted out these illegal immigrants and prompted the flight of 200,000 back to Bangladesh. Then in 1982, a new citizenship law was passed which made the status of the Rohingya um, dubious at best. So the new law stipulated that all the national races of people in Burma were citizens, but if their ancestors arrived during British time, they had to become naturalised and they would start off as guest citizens. Then their descendants by the third generations would become full citizens. So technically by today, which is now 70 years after independence, meaning three generations have passed, citizenship should be equal and available to all. But as we've just said, the colonial legacy, the influx of movement from East Pakistan in 1947 and then the war in 1971 complicates this generation's sort of process. And so the new law made the Rohingya status dubious, which given the tension, pretty much stripped them of any legal uh, rights. And the fact that membership is tied by blood and that that blood is then linked to the land through being a native ancestor it would create ample opportunity for violence. But I also think that more fundamentally, the element of the religious divide has its own role as well. The fact that Islam and Buddhism, from a foundational point in terms of its core elements, are so opposed. One's monotheistic, the other one's non-theistic. And then the historical view of how central Buddhism has been to this region um, mixes together with the idea with the racialized thinking of the, you know, these quote, dark-skinned Bengalis having no place in Arakanese and or Buddhist society. Um, and Burma in 2010 
was a religious society as it ever has been. Um, and it gives the impression that Buddhism is still very central to people's lives. Millions spend time each week in charity work at a local monastery, which welfare organisations are based on. And these monks in Burma are really close to the ordinary people in their local towns and villages. They provide social care, education for orphans and the poor. They provide legal counsel when the courts are corrupt. And they give shelter and food as well as spiritual um, guidance uh, to people's lives. Now the difference is in the Buddhist nationalists, those who politicise the religion for their own ends, um, that they applaud Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD for ending military rule, um, but then they also applaud this idea of power to the people. Um, now for like the Westerner that might mean more representation, but for them, quote, the people means the Burma Buddhists, and that racial element was really integral for them. And then the final element or intersection of all of this is gender. So there's a lot of tension around Muslim men marrying Arakanese women or Buddhist women and with the Islamic practice of polygamy where a Muslim man might marry not one but two Arakanese women um, that there's that fear of you know racial impurity happening that um, the Buddhist woman needs to be protected um, because she's being used, wrongfully used, quote by this other group who are racially and religiously wrong for Burma. 2012 was the year often remembered as the first large-scale flare-up between Arakanese Buddhists and the Rohingya following the alleged rape and murder of a Buddhist woman by three men who were referred to as Bengalis or Kalas in the media coverage. The violence was so bad that the army had to step in and impose martial law, a state of emergency was declared, um, mobs attacked Muslims who were killed, uh, interned Muslims would throw stones and homemade weapons back at them. In total, 75,000 people fled their homes. In 2013, the violence flared up again. As many as 50 were killed and 12,000 displaced. Muslim shops, uh, cinemas, uh, schools and mosques were burned down. By 2016, with the riots, violence and discrimination mounting, Aung San Suu Kyi clearly realised she had to do something and break her silence on uh, the crisis. So she appointed Kofi Annan of the UN to lead an independent commission. Um, this really infuriated the Arakanese nationalists who saw the UN as a foreign you know, encroachment on, on their sovereignty. Nevertheless, she passed the resolution. Annan's report came back stating that um, obviously, unless concerted action was taken between all organs of power in Burma, that the cycle of violence and radicalization would continue. Aung San Suu Kyi, to her credit, accepted the recommendation and then promised to fulfil them. Now, literally a few hours later, this was the 25th of August 2017, a whole year later, a few hours after she pledged that, they, that these recommendations would be fulfilled, the ARSA, the Arakanese Rohingya Salvation Army, launched a series of attacks on 30 police stations and an army base in the north. Ten police were killed. It then escalated. Apparently they um, entered a Hindu village, rounded up around 70 men, women and children um, who were neither of Rohingya or Arakanese descent. They were literally just of Indian descent. Um, they killed the majority of them and then abducted the rest. Now, social media pretty much set on fire with phrases of Islamic terrorism ran rampant and the army went in mercilessly. A series of successive massacres occurred, a killing, torching down villages and rape were used. Now, there's no actual official estimate for the um, death count, but Doctors Without Borders estimates around 6,700 Rohingya were killed um, in those few weeks. The reaction in the West and the Muslim world was devastating. Burma was dubbed the world's human rights nightmare. Um, and by September, 400,000 refugees had crossed into Bangladesh, the biggest single flight of asylum seekers in modern times. Aung San Suu Kyi went on national television. She denied the military operations and denied that there had been any substantial um, you know, refugee exodus. More criticism followed. However, inside Burma, it was a completely different picture. 
the vast majority of the Burmese believe that the ARSA is a terrorist organisation. Many of them applauded the army's offensives. Um, Arakan's Buddhists um, claim that the army actually had to be tougher, that, that they had to start to train um, ordinary people to be able to fight back. Their own army, called the Arakan Army, um, which causes the government a lot of grief over their claims of poor self-government, uh, grew in strength. The chief general went on a series of talks talking about finishing off the unfinished business of, 90, of the 1940s, i.e. the Muslim migrations into Burma. Conspiracy theories ran amok. There was talk of this sort of Western Muslim plot to destabilise and overrun Arakan itself. To what purpose and why was never actually explained. So the conflict is, you know, multi-layered. There's inter-religious and ethnic tensions, but also that feeling of existential threat um, by foreigners alike, Muslims, Westerners, and the Burmese themselves. And just, you know, one final note here. Um, this idea of an existential threat is the most, you know, insane end of the, of the political spectrum. It's not, um, oh, we don't want this particular group to have a majority in parliament or in the economy. It's if they live, we die. It's either us or them, and there's no in-between. Um, you know, by 2014, the Rohingya quarters of um, Ang Mingala in Sitwe were surrounded by barbed wire, and the residents weren't allowed to leave without a pass. The Rohingya are stripped of their ID cards, access to education, healthcare, and humanitarian restrictions as well. So the army refuses, you know, humanitarian groups like the like Doctors Without Borders to travel in and offer assistance. Um, so it's not a far stretch to say that it draws similarities to the 1930s of Europe, of, in Germany. The Nazis viewed the Jews as an existential threat um, to their vision of the Third Reich. And if Hitler was to succeed, the Jews had to die. That was it. Hitler also took part in forming his myth of Germany's history. He referred to the glories of what um, was the First and Second Reich alluding to the power of the medieval Habsburg Empire and then Bismarck in the 19, sorry, 1870s, um, whilst calling the triumph of the Allies of World War I and the Weimar government of a shaman occupation. In a similar way, the Arakanese brothers talk about their medieval empire, the early modern period of Maraku, and the rupture that was European invasion and then Burma's takeover of them. And they claim now that ever since that point of the 1660s, they've been wanting to go back to that part of history and retrieve it in some way, or, you know, bring it back to life. So I hope this episode on Burma has shed light on some of the core issues this country is experiencing. Um, I've certainly learned a lot myself and reading a concise and well-versed account made me appreciate um, I mean, I know this is really depressing content, but even within that, I found a type of appreciation that someone could take all of this and produce a balanced and thoughtful narrative. I think that's what we need when faced with the lowest points of humanity, that there are still voices out there raising awareness, educating and spreading knowledge, and it's on us to listen. Um, as we speak, the Burmese military 2021 has forced Aung San Suu Kyi back under house arrest, and the crackdown against the Rohingya continues. I haven't touched upon Bangladesh um, purely because of time, but I think it would be worthwhile in the future doing an episode on um, or from Bangladesh's perspective um, about the Rohingya seeking refuge within their borders. Until next time, this was your host, Mr. Amin. Thank you for listening to the Voicemails from History podcast.